Hello, I'm Vibika Strand. I, I teach at Stanford University and I'm a consultant and I will be speaking to you today on small molecular immunomodulators. So tofacitinib, that was previously known as tazocitinib and also CP690550, is a novel oral JAK inhibitor. It's being investigated as a targeted immunomodulator in rheumatoid arthritis. It has nanomolar potency against JAK1 and JAK3 and is functionally selective for JAK1 and JAK3 over JAK2. In two six-month phase two uh, are randomized controlled trials, 3, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams BID were superior to placebo. And the safety and efficacy from the long-term open-label extensions from these studies were presented at last year's ACR. There are two of the five phase three randomized controlled trials that have now been presented. These are in DMARD uh, IR, RA patients over either three or six months. Oral SOLO was a monotherapy study that examined 5 and 10 milligrams BID versus placebo <clears throat> and was shown to be statistically significant in signs and symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis as well as physical function. And now the oral SYNC study, 5 and 10 milligrams in combination with DMARDS, was just presented at ULAR. Now, the oral SYNC study included 792 active rheumatoid arthritis patients. They received placebo for six months, although non-responders were rescued at three months. It was a multinational study involving 22% of subjects from North America, about 10% from South America, 28% from Europe, and 40% from the rest of the world, which included 28% from China, as well as subjects from India. 83 to 87% of these subjects had failed methotrexate, 70 to 77% other DMARDs, 6 to 7% TNF inhibitors, and somewhere between 0 and 7% other biologic agents. The co-primary endpoints, as also for the oral solo study, was a hack disability index at month 3, and ACR20 and DAS low disease activity are actually remission by ESR of less than 2.6, both at month six. Now, the study design is as shown, and essentially, as I said to you, there was rescue of placebo non-responders at month three and all placebo patients at month six, such that approximately half of the patients were rescued at month three into either five or 10 milligrams of tofacitinib and the remaining patients at month six. The co-primary endpoints, as I mentioned to you, were at month three and at month six. In terms of the safety, we see that, as you might expect, there were more subjects receiving active therapy that discontinued due to adverse events, but overall the discontinuations due to lack of efficacy were low, and a high number of subjects completed the study. If we look between month zero to three when we have a placebo control, we can see overall that the serious adverse events were on the order of about eight to nine patients in the 5 and 10 milligram dose group versus 6 in placebo, that there were a few subjects that had serious infections. And overall, discontinuations due to adverse events were low. If we then compare this to the month 3 to 6, when we now have approximately half of the patients on placebo, we can see that overall the number of SAEs or SIEs do not uh, increase over time. And this is similarly true when we look after the month 6. So there is a placebo control between months zero to three and months three to six, and that is important in assessing these overall events. If we drill down now into the safety profile of this product, we see that absolute neutrophil counts do decrease in the five and 10 milligram dose group, but there are not further decreases uh, after month six. And overall, there were no subjects that had sustained decreases to less than 500 uh, ANC. Hemoglobin actually increased in the active treatment groups versus no change in the placebo group. LDL cholesterol did increase on the order of 16 to 18 percent in the active treatment group versus no change in placebo, and similar findings over six months. Serum creatinine did show some increases on the order of about five to ten subjects who may have had an increase of above 30 percent in serum creatinine. These increases are idiosyncratic and they're unexplained. We do not know the reason for them, but in fact, 
they do reverse with discontinuation of therapy. Overall, the ALT elevations were low at three times upper limits of normal and not very different between placebo and active. In terms of any increase in ALT, we do see that it's higher in the active treatment group than placebo, but does not increase over the six-month period of time. There were four deaths that were reported, acute heart failure in a subject with known valvular disease and respiratory failure in a subject with COPD, and these occurred during treatment, and two others that occurred after treatment were stopped. One was a traumatic brain injury, and another was worsening rheumatoid arthritis. Overall, there were four opportunistic infections, and these were two tuberculosis, one cryptococcal uh, pneumonitis, and one disseminated herpes zoster. If we now move to the oral solo study design, we see it's very similar, but the primary endpoint for all outcome measurements was at month three. And we can see, again, it was a similar type of randomization between active and placebo, and all placebo patients were rescued at month three. What was presented at this year's ULAR were the secondary outcomes of the patient-reported measures, and these included the HAC Disability Index, which, as you remember, is a co-primary endpoint at month three, and then patient global assessment and pain by VAS, the short form 36 for health-related quality of life, the facet fatigue index, and the medical outcome sleep study, and these were at three months. Oral solo was also represented at ULAR in terms of subgroup analysis comparing the tofacitinib 5 milligram and 10 milligram dose groups showing statistical significance for both active therapies in all of the treatment groups, rheumatoid factor positive, anti-CCP positive, less than or older than 65 years of age, um, less than 50 kilos or greater than 100, male or female, uh, with the exception of one, and that was the, those subjects who had previously failed a biologic agent where 5 milligrams was not as effective as 10 milligrams in a statistical fashion. If we come back to the patient-reported outcomes, I'm showing you here the SF36 scores at month three, and you're looking at a spidergram of the SF36 with physical function at the 12 o'clock, and then we go clockwise to role physical, bodily pain, and general health perceptions domains, and these are the physical domains of the SF36. We then move to vitality, which is PEP, energy, and fatigue, social functioning, role emotional, and mental health. The scores go from zero to 100, higher scores being better, and the grid lines are 10 points, which represents one to two times the minimum clinically important difference of five points. We're looking now at the combined baseline of all patients in the oral solo study, and next is compared to age and gender match normative values from US norms that are specific to this protocol population. So one can see the impact of RA that is largest in physical function, role physical, bodily pain, where the decrements from the age and gender match norms are most evident. But this is also true for vitality, role emotional, and social function. What I'm now showing you is the improvements in the placebo group at three months, which are evident in physical function, role physical, and bodily pain, but are in general small, although bodily pain is clinically meaningful now showing you the improvements at three months in the five milligram tofacitinib group. One can see that these are all statistically significantly better than placebo, and they're quite large. They all meet or exceed MCID in all of the domains, with the largest improvements being in physical function, bodily pain, and also vitality. And now I'm showing you the 10 milligram dose group, which is numerically better in all the domains than the five milligram dose group highly statistically significant versus placebo, and clearly clinically meaningful. In fact, the values reach a normative value for vitality and approach that in the mental health domain. Now, similarly, in all of the other patient-reported outcomes, 5 and 10 milligrams of tofacitinib resulted in statistically significant and clinically meaningful improvements, with the exception of the MOS sleep in the 5 milligram dose group. These changes were so impressive that 77 to 83% of subjects reported clinically meaningful improvements 
in the 5 and 10 milligram dose groups, and the number needed to treat based on these improvements range between 4 and 6 patients. Now, another point about tofacitinib, of course, are the lipid elevations, and a small study was presented by Ian McKinnis that looked at approximately 111 patients to see whether co-administration of atorvastatin would reduce the effects of tofacitinib. So patients were prescribed 10 milligrams BID for six weeks, and you can see between week zero and week six that there were increases in total cholesterol on the order of 21 to 24 percent, increases in LDL cholesterol, 16 to 19 percent, and increases in triglycerides of 7 to 10 percent. Also was an increase in HDL cholesterol of approximately 32 percent and APOA1 of 21 percent. When we now look at the results at week 12, when half of the subjects received atorvastatin in addition to continuing 10 milligrams of tofacitinib, what we see is that these increases were largely abrogated. In fact, the total cholesterol decreased uh, to levels below baseline by 26%. They decreased in LDL cholesterol by 35% to below baseline levels, and they decreased uh, in triglycerides by 15% to levels below baseline. So essentially what we can see here is that the HDL cholesterol does not change and the increase is maintained, but the, de the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides are decreased to the extent that the median LDL cholesterol level is, a, is in the target range of the optimal level based on ATP3 guidelines of less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. Now, the other point being that you can see there's a marked change in the LDL cholesterol, but atorvastatin with tofacitinib certainly does not abrogate the efficacy. In fact, there may be some numerical gain in efficacy with co-administration. So in conclusion, these small molecular immunomodulators, I think, are very promising. Tofacitinib is the furthest along. We've heard about two of the five phase three studies now. It seems to be quite promising both as monotherapy and in combination with methotrexate and other DMARDs. There is some suggestion that safety is a little bit better with monotherapy and that there are fewer LFT elevations. There's certainly a rapid onset of benefit. People have described this as a biologic and a pill. And the big point, I think, will be where will its place be in our therapeutic armamentarium when it is finally approved? We do know that there are other agents like this in development. There's a JAK-1-2 inhibitor earlier in development from from Insight and now licensed to Lilly, and it has a short half-life also with daily dosing as opposed to BID dosing. The sick kinase inhibitor from Rigel that's now being developed by AstraZeneca is promising. Phase two has been completed, and those, those studies have actually been published, both in ANR and the New England Journal of Medicine. There was an abstract here that discussed the HRQOL from the six-month trial that showed that uh, patients reported uh, improved outcomes, both health-related quality of life, pain, and global assessments, particularly in the higher dose group. And finally, there's an oral S1P lyase inhibitor, LX3305, from Lexicon Genetics that was overall disappointing in a phase 2A study, but it's expected to be promising with higher doses since it showed good safety profile, um, but just a hint of efficacy at the highest dose. So with that, I have summarized for you what we know about the small molecular immunomodulators, and I appreciate your attention.